Tonight, JLI and Hawk and Dove end their first arcs faster than a Monty Python sketch. OMAC hits new lows by not even bothering to write the book for two whole pages. And Animal Man and Swamp Thing have both wrapped up their first arcs and I can only gush so hard. All that and more this week on the Not So New 52. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 18 of the Not So New 52. I am your host and welcome to 2012. That's right, we are officially in a brand new year of DC Comics. Nothing has particularly changed. We've still got the same comic lineups and all the same writers and artists really, but things are going to change soon. I'm not going to spoil it. For me personally, uh, for anyone who kept up last week, I had COVID and I'm better now. So... Count my lucky stars there. Also, I don't know if you could tell in the audio version. I'm hoping you can. But in the video version, you can definitely tell. I got a new fancy-ass mic stand arm thing. So uh, hopefully the audio sounds a little bit crisper and a little bit not as ass. But hey, let's talk about what comics we have this week. This week, January 4th, 2012, we have the number five issues of... Detective Comics, Batwing, Action Comics, Red Lanterns, Green Arrow, Justice League International, Men of War, OMAC, Hawk and Dove, Static Shock, Animal Man, and Swamp Thing. Additionally, we have the number four issues for Huntress and Penguin, Pain and Prejudice. Fifteen comics this week, definitely on the longer side, so I'm not going to waste any more time, and we're just going to jump into our first comic of the new year. Detective Comics number five, written by Tony S. Daniel, art also by Tony S. Daniel. Uh, we left off with the end of an arc, so I'm not even going to bother recapping it. Just know the Dollmaker stuff seems to be done. This issue picks up with um, Batman jumping around the city, and he's talking about people who want to see him dead or alive because apparently after the Joker stuff from the first issue... A, like, group of people have been gathering outside of the park that are all, like, pro-Joker and anti-Batman because they think that Batman skinned Joker alive. So that's a thing. So they're just holding, like, riots and protests and whatnot against Batman. And Batman's like, all right, I don't have time for that. I'm going to go actually do something with the night. And apparently he's following around some guy named Axel Bellamy who is a guy who just does some hijacking and stuff like that. And he follows him to another guy named Boris Gorski. Again, no idea what for. Some sort of medical thing, apparently. Regardless, Boris gets a shuriken to the eye. And this dude in a Joker, like, mask that all the protesters are wearing jumps in with some size and other ninja tools. And he just starts killing everybody at this drug deal. Batman swoops in. Tries to follow him, but the guy manages to dodge some punches and then spray acid on the Batman's face. He runs off, gets lost in the crowd of all the Joker protesters, and all the protesters are like, Hey, this dude's dressed as Batman! Let's kick his ass! Yeah! And they all start trying to fight him, but of course he's, you know, Batman. So he gets out of the crowd and he's like, Hey, th- there's a killer over... Someone stop the... Ah, oh, jeez, whatever. So he goes, he gets out, and one of the people in the crowd's like, I think that was actually Batman. Um, so they keep on trying to chase him a little bit, but he manages to almost catch up with the killer, who he keeps on remarking moves without a sound, like he's a complete ninja, totally stealth. Um, but as he's catching up, he sees that the dude took off the mask and the other outfit, he was like the trench coat he was wearing, and jumped into a motorboat and got away with no way of tracing him. Like, there was no face, nothing to identify him. He was hoping to run the mask and get some DNA off of it, But then he sees out of the trench coat falls a a casino chip, like a gambling chip, for the Iceberg Lounge, which is, of course, Penguin's place of residence. Uh, Cut to several miles up the harbor. There's a weird-looking 
mob boss, I guess. He's got like horrible scars and like welts and bumps all over his face. And they call him Mr. Mosaic. And he's basically wondering where his guy is. The dude from before, because the dude stole a briefcase from the drug deal. Uh, he shows up to this with the briefcase. And apparently he's like, he hands over the briefcase and Mosaic is like, oh, this doesn't look like 20K. Are you trying to scam me? And then the dude holds a gun to Mosaic's head. And he's like, all right, I guess we're square. Anything else you need tonight? And he steals Mosaic's limo as well as a VIP card to the uh, Iceberg Lounge, I think. Cut to the Iceberg Lounge. And we get Charlotte, what's her name, from like the beginning and end of this, Charlotte Rivers, the one that Bruce was seeing, the investigative reporter, as well as Hugh Martyr from like issue two, who just shows up again. And they meet on a boat outside the Iceberg Lounge, and Hugh's saying, like, oh, of course, I can get you in because I'm rich and powerful, whatever. Charlotte is there looking for a story, I guess. She gets out of the shower, puts on a, I want to say maid's outfit, but I'm assuming that it's supposed to be the waitress outfit or whatever. And she's just reminiscing on, like, oh, I was supposed to be here with Bruce, but of course he bailed on me and blah, blah, blah. And then we see that cameras were installed inside of Charlotte's room. Penguin is watching all of this, and he tells his enforcers, who are just three ladies that I've never seen before, like, ah, make sure she gets a story to die for. Ha, ha, ha. And that's it. Honestly, I don't really know what this story, like, it's a new story. It's obviously the start of a new arc, but I don't know what I'm supposed to be following here yet, whether it be the Penguin thing or the ninja thing they just seem completely disconnected right now which isn't inherently bad i mean you can have two different storylines that meet up later but i'm just it felt like every turn of the page here was just a different thing you know like page one was the joker protest page two was him following this dude who hijacked a truck page three was this ninja guy page four was back to the joker pro like every page was just its own different thing and i wasn't quite sure where i was supposed to follow it yet but I mean, I'm fine with that for the start of a story. It would be more confusing if we hit the end of it and it's still doing this. So I guess we'll see where it goes from there. I'm going to give this one a 6.5. Uh, art is fine. I have no problems with that at all. I'm just confused as to where the story wants to go with it. They did set up the Joker protests, I believe, in an earlier issue. So this is, you know, a natural progression there. This didn't feel where it's all of a sudden like, oh, and now a bunch of pop people love the Joker for some reason. Like, I'm glad they at least set that up. The Hugh Martyr and the Charlotte River stuff, though, I that was not set up. And I am, if there's any story so far I don't care about, it's going to be that one. But we'll see where it goes. But like I said, 6.5 for this issue. Batwing number five, written by Judd Winnick, art by Ben Oliver. We left off last issue with an entire origin story, backstory for David and his brother Isaac underneath the general Keita, the warlord. And this issue picks up with yet more of that 11 years ago, showing uh, David and his brother being ordered by the general to kill a man who was doused in gasoline, despite the fact that he was just praying to be released like he wouldn't come after them and he he was just wanted to go home and it shows how david basically had to set him on fire alive and he wakes up screaming today it was all a dream a nightmare and he talks how it's his ptsd from all the stuff he did and it used to be like waking ptsd but then it used to then it moved on to just during his dreams and now it's more infrequent but it does some, still come at least once a week so he goes down into his bat cave and Matu's down there and asks whether or not he slept well. And he's like, you know, I didn't sleep well. And he's like, well, do you want to talk about it? He's like, I have already talked to you about this stuff. Why would I need to talk anymore? He's like, because it might make you feel better. But if we're just going to be deflecting tonight, then all right, here we go. So apparently they are having an event for the kingdom, which, of course, was the African Justice League equivalent. Uh, their home base, which they called the Citadel, it's been empty and sealed since... Uh, the team disappeared, but now via funding between, I think we'll get names later, um, but funding between a couple rich billionaires, they are turning it into a museum to represent all the good things that the kingdom did for Africa. So uh, David is putting himself on security detail there so that he can be 
right next to the action, he's had Batman called in, and Batman's also helping do a sweep on this place. So as he's doing security in his civilian gear, or his police gear, I guess, um, Kia shows up, the girl from like three issues ago, and he's like, wow, I'm surprised that you're here considering you were stabbed through the chest. And he's like, oh, it's the kingdom. I had to show up to show my respect. He's like, right, but you, you really shouldn't be on the force considering you were stabbed like two weeks ago through the chest. You were, you were dead. That was pretty much the gist of it. And David... David isn't exactly sensitive here. He's like, well, why are you back here? I mean, yes, all of your, all of your comrades, all of your fellow officers were butchered around you and he let you live probably just because you're a woman and he is like excuse me what was that and he's like oh it's nothing to be ashamed of i just i think he lets you live because that's the only thing that was different about you is that you are a woman and he is like all right well how about you go ahead and uh, head back to your chair and leave this to real police officers and matsu gives him a chewing out over the earpiece because he's like wow that was dumb you're an idiot so anyway, they talk about how secure the building is. Uh, Batman gets off the comms and says, oh, I'm going to stay back in the shadows. I'll contact you if anything comes up. But that's mainly because now currently walking through the building is uh, Josiah Cohn, who is one of the people who funded this place, along with Bruce Wayne, who's there. And they're talking about how good the kingdom did and blah, 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 and why Josiah is interested. And Bruce Wayne pointed out, I was like, you know, Josiah... In my circles, we uh, we all pretty much know that you worked with the kingdom. You were the person who pretty much built this building and gave them all their tech and stuff. You you were the smart guy behind the scenes. So I think you're here more for wanting to honor your friends than honor the team. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about, but um, maybe. So they just talk about how great the kingdom is for a second, but, and then it swings over to, yeah, but if you hear all this stuff, then maybe maybe you know that someone's been killing them off. Are you, and we all know that you fund Batman, Bruce Wayne, so are you going to stop these killings? And then we see the crowd of people who's gathered. Um, one of them has the massacre skull mask on, starts firing through the crowd, and it's not a normal gun. It's like a sound gun, that like, and also a laser. I mean, it causes stuff to catch on fire, but it makes sense that it's had a massive explosive effect. So... Bruce Wayne gets Josiah out of there as it seems that that's what the massacre guy is firing at. But then we also see that there are multiple ones of them in the crowd, like multiple people wearing the mask. One of them targets Kia. Uh, Kia gets him shot off, but mas the massacre stand in still there. None of these people are massacre, by the way. They're all just people who were hired or are being used and they look like him mask wise. So Batwing swoops in and he's like, hey, Officer Kia, uh, get out of here. Get all the people out of here. We need to evacuate. Me and Batman will deal with this. So Batman and him swing in. They see a bunch of people who are all wearing the mask and they just start kicking ass, knocking everybody out. And then eventually one of them makes a call over a headset that says that the area is clear once all of the people are out of the building. And then they feel the ground shake beneath them. And Batman puts two and two together that they are literally demolishing the Citadel. They are burning it to the ground. But they didn't want any actual human life to be lost. Like none of the civilians. They were doing this once everyone was clear. So they set off the explosives. The entire kingdom or the entire Citadel comes down. It was set out in rural Africa so that they could be away from like cities for this exact situation. So nobody's hurt around them. Everyone made it out fine. It was strictly just to tear down this symbol of the kingdom. And at that point, Batwing manages to grab one of the um, people by the head, just smashes his skull against the ground, and just starts screaming at him, or he's going to rip his eyes from his head. Um, eventually, the plans revealed that, you know, oh, the, he hired us to do this. We were waiting until everyone was gone, blah, blah, blah. And he gets the headset, like the cell phone that was connected to it. He hits redial so that it can callback massacre and matu is tracing it back in the cave and he sees that massacre is all the way in egypt in the city of giza and that batwing grits his teeth and says that's where this will all end so we're going to egypt uh, i like this issue just in terms of i like how it gave a bit more character development for david with the kia thing 
also there was some narration in there of like how he welcomes the rage of what's going on and stuff like that like i don't know give some character development there i like how they treated batman in this where he is more experienced he's running a bit more of the team like not the team but like the oper operation i guess is the word i'm looking for but i think the biggest part of it is the fact that this guy is not just going after like killing out off the kingdom members he also was just destroying everything they stood for like he's just destroying what is now a museum so no i i I like this story as it's moving so far um it definitely gives a lot of traction because it was a huge building my only complaint is the fact that we didn't have this set up beforehand like we introduced it and destroyed it in the same issue so it just feels kind of cheap of like look at this magnificent okay it's gone it's gone and you're supposed to feel things about that um, but no, overall, fine issue. I'm going to go ahead and give it a seven. Uh, we have the normal artist back, Ben Oliver, who was not on the last issue. And it, ooh, I love his art so much. It really does look good. So no, seven for this. Really looking forward to seeing how it wraps up because we've only got one issue left in this trade. So should probably finish next time. Action Comics number five, written by Grant Morrison, art by Andy Kubert. We left off last issue with a bunch of stuff that I'm not going to care about because this issue is completely unconnected. Grant just decided he got tired of the story he was telling and decided to do something else. So this issue picks up with Krypton literally falling apart. If everything's burning and I'm cracking apart and we see Jor-El and I think it was Lara is her name and they've got Baby Clark and Crypto the Superdog and they are just trying to find a way to escape and Jor-El suggests okay I kind of sucks that I was right about the entire planet falling apart but hey we can get out of here we just have to go through the Phantom Zone and jor explains it's an anti-universe that was made as a jail for Krypton super criminals, but now it's their only way out. So he boots up the projector to allow him, his family, and his dog in. And then as he approaches it, they see all the super criminals that I guess they've put away. And the super criminals are just standing there like, yeah, jor you put us here. Come on in. As one of them that seems to be like the leader has a metal claw that literally reaches through the portal, which is not supposed to be possible. And he's like, come on in, and we're going to come in, and we're going to mess up your life, and we're going to corrupt your son, and everything's going to be awful for you. And then as he's monologuing, Crypto leaps up, bites onto the dude's hand, and he gets pulled in as the guy tries to retract his hand. So Crypto went to the Phantom Zone as the projector starts to shatter, and therefore they can't get in there anymore so they're like okay we need a plan b what's a plan b and laura makes the suggestion of the rocket and they go and there's this rocket that they made as an experimental model to show that they could make like an arc that would get all of krypton's people off but of course it was shut down um and they were like look it's not big enough for a person it was supposed to be used for an animal test pilot but it's also big enough for our baby. So they put it in there. Uh, they say the goodbyes to Kal-El, their son. And as the ship takes off, Krypton begins to completely fall apart. And this is, the rest of the story is told from the perspective of the ship. Like, they say, first off, they say that the ship has onboard Brainiac AI and a super luminal drive. So it's able to go faster than light. But anyway, it's all told from the ship. And they're like, look, ship... Go to a place with a young son uh, so he can get super strong via like photosynthesis, whatever. Give it a planet that has weaker gravity so it seems like he's like flying over them. And just scan for that ship. Okay, go. And they send it off. And the planet explodes behind the ship. It goes into like a protective cocoon thing as it activates its faster than light drive. It flies off. It does the calculations. It finds exactly what was asked of it it has a young son the gravity the gravity is only one fifth of krypton's gravity and it has oxygen and stuff which i guess are necessary for kryptonians as well and it starts crashing down to earth and we see martha and john kent who martha's upset because she 
uh, I guess recently miscarried and John's not exactly being super sensitive about it. He's just like, oh, are you still upset about the deformed calf from good old Bessie? It's like, no, I'm upset about losing our baby, John. But then they see the rocket crash down. They go over and investigate and they see the baby inside and they're like, okay, um, I guess we're taking the baby. So they take that as military choppers all start arriving. They start making their way out and it's like, okay, well, hold on. I think I, John's like, I think I have a way that we can throw off the scent. Uh, we see the ship's perspective again. It does a scan on the planet and sees that they are essentially apes with atom bombs are the exact words used. So it's like if the technology within me got into their hands, it would all be over for them. So I'm going into silent mode. Then we cut back to the John thing real quick. And John drove back towards the military site. Uh, the, some soldiers stop him and he's like, I did that. They use some excuse about it being a chemical spill or something. And John's like, no, no, no. I know exactly what this was. I reckon we got a spaceman in the back. So why don't you check that out? And maybe you can give me some reward money or something. And it ends up being Bessie's deformed calf is what he's trying to pass off as an alien. Which is why like three issues ago, Lex thought that that's what a Kryptonian looked like. Because it was Bessie's deformed calf. Anyway, so we cut to the ship. The ship is unloaded by a bunch of um, soldiers. They f do some firing tests at it. And then we see silent mode turned off once uh, kal -El Superman finds the ship again. And the ship is talking to him. And he's like, many greetings, star child of the great star and the waxing moon. And, he's, and then Clark puts his hand on and says, protect yourself. We'll be back soon. Goes black again. We see Lex hitching a ride along in the truck that has his ship and then it just says how uh then the collector came to earth and everything was changed forever so began the age of superhumans uh and then we see that it's been growing these like icy looking spikes all over it so that's a thing and i guess this takes place after the spicy ike part but uh then we see that a group of criminals, which I think are the ones that were inside the Phantom Zone, because one of them has the same metal claw hand, they reach the ship and they're like, oh, this is before Superman's Fortress of Solitude was able to protect itself against time travelers. So they're time travelers. They reach in and they rip out the kryptonite engine that was powering the ship. And then they just reminisce for a bit of how all kryptonite in the universe came from this specific source. And then I guess the ship's defending itself. They all teleport out. They have a couple names in here listed, like uh, Drekken. Uh, I guess I, it's really hard to tell what in the hell's going on in this section. But anyway, they all disappear. A uh, group of other people rush into the room and be like, oh, no, the perfect break-in, and we couldn't prevent it. Um, we're up against something that can... Erect impregnable shields around events. This is beyond even the time trapper. The kryptonite engine is gone. And we see three superheroes, which I know are from the Legion of Superheroes, but they make no indication of that. And an older Superman, still wearing his Kryptonian battle armor. And they say how the engine is now in the hands of the anti-Superman army, who are time travelers and in this. And apparently with the uh, kryptonite engine the planet is doomed to die which seems to be a running theme uh, why did we do this now i don't understand full disclosure this book this trade was put in the order of one two three four seven eight five six so it was real confusing for me when i first started reading and realized i had to skip ahead to this issue but um no, yeah, it's... I don't understand why we're doing this right now. Like, maybe... Because I think this is a two-parter. I think we're going to get the same story next month as well. Maybe we'll get some extra insight as to what's going on in the old story. But I, I, I have no clue what's going on right now. I am so lost. And we just threw in Time Travelers and the anti-Superman army and all this extra stuff. I don't know what's going on. I'm kind of looking forward to figure out, but... As it has been on this show, I'm always very confused with Legion of Superhero stuff, and this is no exception. So I'll give it a 7 because I liked everything right up until those like last four pages of like the Rocket story and his coming to Earth. But as soon as you got into the time-traveling anti-Superman army, I'm, I'm out. 
I don't know what's going on, but seven for the rest of it. Red Lanterns number five, written by Peter Milligan, art by Ed Benes and Diego Bernard. We left off last issue with Zillia Sox, Scalox, and that last brain tentacle one that I'm forgetting the name of, uh, all sinking into the blood ocean while Atrocitus discovers that Crona, the dead guardian, his body has been taken. This issue picks up right afterwards. Atrocitus walks up to the resting place of Crona, picks up his, like, casket or whatever you want to call it, just to double check that he wasn't underneath or something, and then immediately runs off to go punish Bleeze because he blames Bleeze for it. They get into a fight. And Atrocitus is like, oh, I know that you're conniving now that you're intelligent or whatever, but you owe me and blah, blah, blah. How dare you take Corona? And Louise is like, okay, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's completely coincidence that he's missing at the same time that I'm smart. But here's the possibility that you may have overlooked through your rage. What if Corona is just alive again? Weirder things have happened. And Atrocitus is like, maybe. We cut real quick to that weird shadowy figure that we saw last issue briefly. Uh, he's still creeping around and he's saying like, oh, gotta keep moving. Oh, here comes that pitiful fool, Atrocitus. We see Atrocitus uh, going back to the casket, whatever you want to call it. It's just a big rock that he was resting on. I don't know what you want to call it. But um, he's like, no, no, no. He was dead. I punched my fist through his decaying body and I smelled his rotting meat. He's dead. But they're standing there like, okay, well, I don't know what to tell you. He's he's not here. And I didn't take him. So, And Atrocitus turns over to please and is just like, alright, get those losers that we just threw in the blood ocean out of the blood ocean. We're going to need everyone we can in order to find Krona. And she's like, excuse me? It sucked the last time I went down there. I don't want to go down there again. Are you trying to get rid of me? By, like, throwing me down there after them. And he's just like, enough! Go! Get them! I'm through with your insubordination. And she's like, well, fine, whatever, I guess. And <laughs> as she's, like, picking herself up from being thrown around, Dexstar shows up. And he's like, wow, you know, one day your master's going to attack me one too many times. I hope you know that. And Dexstar just... I, I want to say it's a hiss, but it just looks like he's coughing up a hairball. So anyway... She dives into the blood ocean, goes down for uh, Ratchet. That was the name of the last guy. And Ratchet's going through more of his memories of how he was tortured and what made him so rage-filled. And apparently, uh, for wanting to feel contact with other members of his species, all of his, like, tendrils and all of his, um, I don't know what you should call it, the extremities, they were all chopped off so that he couldn't feel anything. And then it was an 80-year sentence uh, on his 14th year, he went on a hunger strike, so they held his mouth open and filled it with the nutrients he needed. Uh, after 20 years, he started hallucinating. After, uh, or no, sorry, after 20 years, he started with the rage. After 40 years, he started hallucinating. And then finally, he got so enraged and so crazy, a red ring found him. He spontaneously grew a new tendril. And he put it on and became a Red Lantern. Uh, Atrocitus is then flying through the sky, and he's just like, oh, man, this place kind of sucks. But, hey, look, there are feet down there. They're slow and dragging like a dead guy's feet would be. Better go investigate. And then an explosion happens, and he sees the dark figure coming after him. And he's like, whoa, hey, hold on, wait a minute. Krona, is that you? Krona, I'm so happy you're alive, so I get to kill you again myself. This is fantastic. But he starts getting the crap beat out of him. And then everything goes black. And that's where we leave for there at the moment. Uh, we cut back to Bleeze, who then pulls out Zillia Sox, who once again does not have his origin story shared. I don't, they give the other two, but they specifically do not show Zillius's backstory. Anyway, so Bleeze lets the two of them know, like, hey, yeah, so Atrocis wants us to uh, send out divine retribution upon the people who have been. Uh, evil or whatnot throughout the galaxy so we're going to be a righteous fury and uh ratchet's like okay well who decides righteous fury like who decides who deserves it and it's like well we do he's like so we're judge and jury that doesn't seem right and so it's just like man i like that idea it sounds good to me so how would you shut up and um 
he asked where the third one was, and Bleed's like, oh, I couldn't find him. He's still down there. So then we cut to him, and he's still drowning in the blood ocean. Show a bit more of what happens after he got tossed in a furnace alive by a mob enforcer. And it shows that as his skin was burning off, he just became super enraged that he was betrayed by his, like, friend, I guess, his partner, whatever you want to call it, uh, and a Red Rain found him. And so Bleeze drags him out, and he starts talking to them. And Ratchet makes the point of, like, wait a minute, did you say you were, like, part of the mob? And he's like, yeah, I, I killed people. I killed a lot of people. And he's like, okay, well, all I did was want to touch. So it kind of disappoints me that rage doesn't really differentiate between good and evil, which means that any sort of mission we have is not going to be one for good or evil. And Atrocity shows up and she's like, all right, all of you, shut up. We're not doing that righteous thing right now. Right now we're hunting down Krona. And so he says the Red Lantern Oath and gets his team ready then we real quick cut back to earth where that story's been going on and jack is watching his brother being taken out by the police for arson and as he's watching his brother be taken out the brother like accidentally elbows or purposely elbows even a police officer and that triggers the police officers beating him to death with their nightclubs and yeah his brother's just lying bloodied and dead on the uh sidewalk he walks up to him, starts crying, and there's all this narration about, like, he lets himself be angry for the first time in his life, and the rage consumes him, and blah, blah, blah. But either way, Red Lantern Ring shows up, puts it on him, and now Jack Moore has finally lost control of his rage. And that's where we're leaving off with human Red Lantern Jack Moore. <sighs> it's kind of a do-nothing issue. You know, like, okay, Krona went away, but then, like, what even happened? Atrocitus blacked out, and then he came to, and then they just had their oath and did that. The only thing that really established in this issue is, okay, now he has four other lanterns that are smart and are able to think. And then, of course, the Jack Moore thing, like that. But that feels so separate that it may as well be, like, a backup story at this point. It doesn't even feel like it's connected at all. It will be. Just looking at the cover of the next issue, it will be. But for right now, it just feels like a okay, and then this happened. So overall, uh, I'd say it's a six. Like, it's fine, but it just kind of pivoted real quick since the end of the last issue of, okay, and now Corona's gone. Like, I was kind of looking forward to them send, spending the arc doing the Righteous Fury thing. But it's just like, yeah, but we'll get to that later. First, Corona's gone. I'm like, okay, I guess. Whatever. So six for this one. Art's fine. Nothing to complain about. Pretty house style. So, yeah, we'll see what happens next issue. Green Arrow, number five, written by Dan Jurgens and Keith Giffen, art by Dan Jurgens as well. Last issue we left off with Blood Rose revealing she has superpowers and then getting away from Green Arrow. This issue picks up with Blood Rose coming back to her cave. It's, it's literally a shipping container with um, Midas, who he's all caring and tender, and he's like, oh, he almost killed you. But you, you need to be careful, but at least now we know that the archer is territorial. And he's just, he's really upset that Green Arrow hurt her and is going to, on his way to get revenge as she rests up. So we cut over to Green Arrow. He manages to sneak his way back into his own office. And now he has to pretend like he's been there the whole time, I guess. His assistant walks in and finds him, like, he's out of his costume, but he's still, like, pretty much just naked. And he's like, well, it's like you've never seen me in my underwear before. That's pretty normal. And the assistant then just reveals that apparently the CEO gave the assistant veto power over any of oliver's ideas or whatever stuff he wants to do so that way like he likes the assistant so much that he's not going to fight it i don't know it's all told via third person via his two like the people behind the chair sort of people and genuinely for the life of me i cannot figure out what this page is saying like Every panel is disconnected from every other panel. And I just... The last panel on this page is... Do you think Wonder Woman's breasts are real? I don't know what they're talking about. So I'm just going to keep going. 
Uh, then we see what I can only assume is Midas' backstory. It's told via literal sentence fragments, and they are not, like, they're barely connected. And basically you just see that there's some guy, he was working on, like, a solution for handling toxic materials. He's seduced by some woman who then tries to kill him. They end up exploding his lab and he's doused in toxic chemicals. And now he became this big hulking toxic waste dump. That's it. That's the gist of it. So anyway, uh, Midas once again is going on his way to go hurt Green Arrow because Green Arrow hurt his beautiful Blood Rose who actually loves him for him. Anyway, we cut over to q Core again and... Oliver and the assistant are just walking out as Midas busts his way in to the building. And basically, like, he, Oliver tells his assistant, like, hey, get out of here, Adrian. And then Midas is like, no, she stays. I want you to leave. She's going to be my hostage so that Green Arrow shows up. And Oliver hears this and is like, all right. And he runs off. He immediately gets changed into his Green Arrow stuff. The one girl is behind the uh, chair talking to him and basically saying like do we know this guy has he shown up anywhere before and they're like no we have no idea why he hates you regardless get into the fight so he gets adrian away from midas and then they just start shooting and talking bad about each other how midas is so upset that blood rose got hurt and green arrow's like well she kind of was a bitch so that of course does not go over well we see that Green Arrow is able to shoot Midas like through the arms and through the chest and nothing stops him and the toxic chemicals within him just disintegrate it. Uh, the person behind the chair says not to let Midas lay a hand on Ollie or else he'll get toxic burns. Uh, so then at one point, Green Arrow's like, okay, all right, I've got an idea. How about some nerve toxin to put you to sleep? And literally everybody, from the person in the chair to Midas, is like, why did you think more toxins would stop me? And he's like, uh, good point. So anyway, Midas is done with the fight. He's pissed off. He gets his hand on Green Arrow's shoulder and starts burning him. And as he's about to kill him, Oliver takes one of his arrows out, shoves it through the bottom of Midas' uh, jaw up towards his skull, and then flips a switch and it turns out to be a like supersonic banshee arrow that is enough to put him out and he falls to the ground and the person behind the chair is like wow good good call using the banshee arrow and oliver's like i had no idea what that was i just used an arrow and i'm lucky that it worked but as he's trying to figure out all right who is this guy what is he going to do blood rose shows back up and holds a gun to oliver's head and was just like ah oh, We've, we've got you. She doesn't actually say that. I can't figure out what she's saying. Four pounds of pull, three pounds of pressure. Your move. I'm assuming that's talking about the gun, but I, it's, it's, your guess is as good as mine. That's where we leave off. Man, I don't like this. I don't like this. Like, I, don't, I can't even remember what Blood Rose was going after Green Arrow 4. I think she was going after Oliver, but now... He doesn't, Midas doesn't care about Oliver and is strictly going after Green Arrow. Like, what are we doing with this story? I don't, next issue is both of them fighting at the same time. So, great, cool, awesome. This is a four. Like, it's, it's really dragged down by that, like, two entire pages. One page of, I don't know what they're talking about, and the other page is literal sentence fragments. Ah, this book frustrates me and I don't want to keep doing it, but it's one of the most longest running series of the whole New 52, so please pray for me. Justice League International number 5, written by Dan Jurgens, art by Aaron Lepresti. We left off last issue with the JLI seemingly incinerated and all of the golem things on Earth all activate as whoever this guy's name is plans on destroying the world i i don't think i'm going to remember his name for the rest of this issue so just the big bad anyway we open up it is a bunch of news stations all saying how it's the end of the world and blah 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 and we cut back to sorry his name is paraxis never mind it's on page one anyway we go back up to the uh ship and he's just looking out at all the stuff that's being scattered from Earth being destroyed. 
and apparently they're using like a mining laser in order to get all of the worthwhile things and then they'll like de-atomize them and re-atomize them later whatever who cares so they start firing off like defensive laser or defensive satellites and nukes up at the ship and Paraxis is like all right well take care of them and the ship just starts shooting them before they can do any sort of damage like no problem whatsoever and we see a newscaster throughout all this and he's like oh the nukes have been fired and oh he's destroyed them all right um where's the justice league where's superman which is a very good question where is superman but regardless we see that um booster gold he used a force field to protect everybody from the explosion at the end of the last issue guy gardner's like well i could have done that too so they start talking options as to how they're supposed to be able to survive um, and go after the the Paraxis up there. And basically they're just throwing around theories of like who this guy is and why he would be able to do what he's doing. None of it is anything new because at least I feel like we already got it. Like they're all just saying like, oh, he's he's a miner, but he's so much more than that too because of blah, blah, blah. So anyway, Booster calls up the dude who made the team, Briggs, and he's like, hey, yeah, we're still alive. Uh, can you tell us what's going on? And like, well, the military is going to strike the golems that you're at. And he's like, oh, d- tell them not to do that. As we see the ships exploding overhead. And he's like, okay, all right, well, they're dead. Um, we're going we're gonna to take the fight to Paraxis. We get, we'll, we'll figure it out. And they got to do it before these lasers end up enveloping one of the major cities. So they... Plan on going up. Godiva is all of a sudden really skeptical. She's like, well, "Hold on, we're going into space to fight aliens." I was more of a street level thing. I don't think my, I don't think my hair powers are going to be able to do much. And they all just start bickering and bickering. And I don't care. Like, ev- just assume everyone is angry with everyone else except for Booster, who's just trying to keep them all together. That's the gist of it. Um, so they're like, "All right, so to get up to a ship, we need an impervious spaceship that can move fast enough to get there without." him blowing them to smithereens what do we got uh we real quick cut to the un and we see the briggs is being chewed out by director bow who's like we never should have made this team to begin with you'll get a stern talking to soon soon but then they see up on the monitors that they took their jet plane guy gardner added a rocket to the bottom with his green lantern energy and they're having it zoom towards the ship as fast as possible to which it then is just eliminated. He just shoots it with the laser and it blows up. And they're like, okay, well, JLI is gone. Then we see the actual plan was they hid out inside of one of the meteors that's like being spewed off the earth. They carved out a hole in that and they're slowly trying to just push it towards the ship slow enough that Paraxis doesn't notice. And it works. They manage to get in there. They seal up the... um, ship so that they have an atmosphere and then they're like all right a team you go try to shut down the ship which is batman and gen and red rocket and like one other person i can't remember and b team we're all gonna go fight paraxis and guy gardner takes a second to actually say you're doing good booster just leave this to the experts so then they go and they fight paraxis and they're literally failing as they have this entire series um And then we cut to B team or A team, whichever one I said, who gets into the control room, which Red Rocket just kind of knows. Rocket Red just knows. And he he walks in and he's like, oh, we'll see if I can figure this out. Tap, tap, tap. And he starts mashing with the buttons. And the we cut back to the other team who's fighting Paraxis. And as Booster's about to be beheaded, Godiva swoops in and uses her hair powers to steal Paraxis' weapon. To which then everyone suddenly is like all on the same like team and they're all understand like Guy manages to get him bound up in the uh, Green Lantern energy and Vixen manages to get a claw against his face. So that happens. Alarms are going off because uh, they are currently rocketing, not falling, but actively rocketing their way down towards Earth because of them messing with the control system. And Parax is like, what did you do? All right, I'm out of here, but we're not done yet. So he flies off into space without a ship. And as as they are plummeting towards Earth, Guy makes some Green Lantern stuff to try to like lasso it back so it doesn't crash into Earth. It doesn't really end up working, and it still crashes really hard. But it crashes into one of the Titan Golem things. 
which seemingly takes it out. Uh, the whole team makes it out safe. And then we just get one page of wrap-up to this entire arc where they're standing at this crater of this giant ship. Briggs is chewing out Booster, and Booster's like, well, hold on, hold on. The Earth isn't destroyed. No major cities were destroyed. And the mission was successful. So shut up, Briggs. We did good. And it all thanks to my buddy Guy Gardner here. And Guy Gardner's just like, don't touch me. But yes, it was thanks to me. And then Godiva comes up and hits on Booster Gold some more. And then we just get one panel of them being watched by a mysterious figure who says, man, I can't believe they did that. Well, time to accelerate our plans for their doom. And that's how it ends. I don't understand that ending. I, that was just way too much of like a, oh, geez, well, this will surely, we got to wrap this up in two pages. Okay, um, Paraxis just leaves and they crash the ship, which also disables the robots. Done. Like, what? No. What? It was confusing at best. And honestly, like, how they got the upper hand on Paraxis, even for that brief period of time, is not explored either. So, all in all, I'm thinking this is like a 5.5, mostly for the writing just not doing enough. But art-wise, it's okay, I guess. It's the same it's been. It's house style. I can't really speak too much to that. But no, 5.5 for this. I guess the arc is over. I, I I can't tell you for sure, but I think it is. So we'll see what happens next issue. But yeah, if, if Justice League International, I guess. <music> Men of War number five, written by Ivan Brandon, art by Tom Derenick. We left off last issue. With Sergeant Rock being hit by a truck, he flips the truck, it goes underwater, he shoots the man who was driving it, the man looked like he's been dead for weeks, he goes back up to the surface, he gets lassoed around the neck by a very large man in silhouette, who then we see is able to speak English and says how they're American. I say all of that because that is how this issue opens. We get a full recap with full visuals doing all the same stuff again. I don't know why. It takes up two pages. Regardless, we then see what happens next. Um, he's basically asking, like, all right, who did that? Who's, what's going on? And we see that it is a mercenary-looking group who are saying, like, all right, look, we're not going to hurt any of your team, but you got to do everything else we say. All right? Got it? And they say put up his hands. He, he puts up one of his hands. The other one, however, is holding a cooked grenade. So he's kind of keeping his fist closed on that. And they notice. So he's like, oh, he's got something in his hand. Put it down. Put it down. He's like, well, if you insist. And he throws it into the center of their group. Everyone freaks out as the explosion goes off. Um, Sergeant Rock manages to get into the middle of it. He picks up two of the other guy's guns and holds it to their heads. One of them is like, look, the one who, like, lassoed him out of the water is like, look, we've got you surrounded, and we don't want, you don't want to see the rest of us, all right? And he, and the other guy's like, I've been shot before. So Sergeant's like, all right, well, we're going to have to improvise here. So he pistol whips the one guy that he's got a handle on. He talks to the rest of his troop, and he's like, all right, you heard it. We're not alone out here. Let's keep this slow and simple. And immediately one of the guys is like, got it, headed to higher ground. <laughs> And Sergeant's like, no, you idiot, as he's shot multiple times throughout his body. Um, we cut back to the dude. And by the way, he's got this big red X on his forehead for whatever reason. And he's like, look, that was stupid. That, what you guy there was really stupid. And he deserves to die. But I'm not going to kill him if you listen to everything we say, okay? We don't want to kill you Americans. We just need to do our thing here. And Sergeant Rock is like, all right, he says he's not going to kill him. I'll give him a chance. So they're all black bagged and they're brought somewhere in silence. And they show how they they did surgery on, or at least they tell Sergeant Rock that they did surgery on the guy. They dug out a bullet and they've got him stitched up and he's recovering. And Sergeant Rock is like, I want to see my guy. And he's like, yeah, okay, well, someone else wants to see you first. And this dude comes out and he makes a comment how the first guy who's been talking has an American accent, like down South American accent. But this dude who just comes out, he's pale white just huge like eight foot minimum and he's he's just totally like albino and he's got some accent that no one can recognize and he comments on how sergeant rock managed to 
kill one of their guys with just a pistol, who I think they're talking about the guy in the truck at the beginning who looks like he's been dead for, like, weeks. So I don't know if that's actually the guy, but regardless. Um, then a spy truck or a spy plane from the U.S., like a drone, is flying over top. And this guy just pulls out one of his guns and shoots it down out of the air. And he's like, look, I'm just going to skip half the foreshadowing here. But basically their reveal is that these guys are all essentially immortal soldiers from different wars. The one dude that he pistol whipped was from the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the dude with the red X on his head is from the American Civil War, who uh, was like a very well-known uh, guy named Gravedigger. And then this guy, who's pale and whatever, is even older than them. I don't know. Whatever. Point being is that one of the soldiers is explaining all this to Sergeant Rock. And he's like, this is stupid and crazy. And the pale guy's like, no, you're stupid and crazy. We're not, we're not liars. We're telling you the truth. And he's like, yeah, okay, whatever. So Sergeant Rock is playing along at the very least. But he wants to know, A, why they're there. And B can he see the soldier that was healed up and apparently they were hired to protect the ship from like three issues ago that sergeant rock and them were hired to destroy so they're on the other side of this who they were hired by they don't specifically say but the guy's like all right look i'll i'm keeping you alive because i'm impressed by you i'm impressed by your spirit and your valor and whatever else so that's the only reason and I will keep you out of harm's way as long as you're here. So he takes the guy who's from the Pol Napoleonic Wars to go see the uh, recovering soldier. And they just start, like, backhandedly insulting each other until finally Rock takes it too far um, by saying, like, like the Napoleonic guy is like, I've, I've fought Napoleon and won, and we changed the face of the world on that day. And Sergeant Rock's like, well, I changed your face, so what does that make me? And the guy charges at him and he hits hard and he's super fast so clearly he's got something going for him but in the middle of the fight rock manages to break out of his restraints and pulls a pistol on him and makes the comment of like oh how did you get out of there and he's like i'm from brooklyn and then we cut to black and i don't know what happens next but it was fun i i this one like last issue was 100 percent action focused like that whole last bit with the truck i thought that was extremely well done this is more of the explanatory issue and honestly it didn't really feel that necessary to explain that much. They didn't explain that much. There's still a lot of mystery surrounding these guys. But it just, I don't know, this issue felt like kind of like an okay and sort of thing. Like, okay, these are the people who are in charge of stopping you from completing your mission. But like, okay, and? You know, I was more interested in them trying to find survival. Like trying to make their way through enemy infested territory and make it out to an extraction point. But this is just kind of like, all right, well, now we're just taking this detour route with this other group, which can be fun. I'm not saying it's not. But right now, I'm just still in the point like, all right, but what are we doing with these guys? Um, Art-wise, I liked it. I really like the way that they, they're they making Sergeant Brock snarkier with these people. Like, he understands that he's able to take a lot of them on, or at least they're not willing to kill him. So he's able to say a lot more and do a lot more. Um, so I like the way they wrote that. Otherwise, whatever for the actual plot reveal. Maybe it'll get something later on, but right now it's just like, all right, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give this one a 6.5. With all that said, nothing nothing really more to add to justify that. But yeah, 6.5 feels pretty fair for this. The long recap at the beginning is a bit confusing, but hey, whatever. A writer will do a recap however he wants. Literally re-showing the same panels again, I guess, is one way to do it. OMAC number five, written by Dan DiDio and Jeff Lemire and Keith Giffen, who also did the art. We left off last issue with just a whole big fight scene with crocodile sewer gators and then the reveal that Frankenstein is in this issue. And wouldn't you know it, Frankenstein is in this issue uh we pick up with checkmate who is co-liaisoning with shade who if you're not reading the frankenstein series is their whole thing 
I'm, I'm just going to assume you're reading the Frankenstein series with me, so I'm just going to skip over half this backstory here. But basically, Father Time runs Shade, and Checkmate asks for help in taking down Omac, and they sent Frankenstein, because Frankenstein just seems to be the general enforcer for Shade. And he's not happy with Checkmate, but they're doing this interdepartmental thing, so whatever. So then we cut back to Cadmus, and we immediately get Kevin Coe, who's just being subjected to the whole, okay, Kevin, what would it, what would you say you do here at Cadmus? Because we're looking to trim some fat. And Kevin's like, um, I'm sorry, who are you? And she gives a whole name, but I doubt she's ever going to be important. Her name's Leilani Lugo, in case it is. But uh, she walks away, and Kevin's like, oh, God, this is the last thing I need. And also, she just threatened to get me fired. So he goes out to a break. And him and Brother I just have this brief conversation about Kevin's problem with authority. But then he just goes and get a hot dog, and apparently this is his regular hot dog place. He does, like, every day at the same time. And Kevin's just talking to the hot dog guy like, man, doesn't it feel like these problems just come in, like, clusters? Hot dog guy runs off. Kevin looks up as Brother I tells him to, and he sees Frankenstein literally about to drop down on top of him. Um, he does his own activate thing, turns into OMAC, and apparently they had, like, trace on his energy and that's how frankenstein was able to find him i don't know regardless they get into a fight scene and brother eyes like "Mm, i didn't think the checkmate would ever work with shade and i didn't think they could uh get your energy signature that soon both things my bad anyway uh go ahead and start fighting with frankenstein because he's kind of a big deal but uh yeah you're omax so just deal with it so they just have an extended fight scene, and I'll only chime in with it when it becomes important. But they just they just keep fighting, and Frankenstein keeps saying, like, wow, you're tough, but you need to go down now. And Omax like, roar. And that's basically it. Um, the rest of this is that basically Omax, or sorry, Brother Eye is like, oh, well, I could use this to get into Shades Networks, which would really be beneficial for me. So didn't, you know, it, every closed window is an open door or whatever it's called so he he tries to hack into their stuff but father time and the other shade people were like okay well i mean we can it's it sucks that checkmate didn't tell us about brother i but we can deal so they're trying to like shut down their stuff so they can talk to brother i but not be hacked by them and also maybe get some intel from brother i if they can and it's basically just a big game of chess between them back and forth of um, trying to figure out, like, oh, well, I've already closed my network, so you can't get me. And it's like, ah, oh, but we've sent robots in order to hack into you. Ah, oh, well, I've absorbed the robots, so they can't do this. And it's just them going back and forth, essentially ending up in a stalemate where nobody's able to do anything. So that was pretty much useless there is one thing i want to talk about right here during the fight between frankenstein and omac and that's there's this really actually decent looking two-page spread of frankenstein and omac fighting there is however no like sound effect on the page no like crackoom or wham or whatever there is however an editor's note that says editor's note add any sound effect you want i'm sitting back and enjoying this Epic Battle, written by Harv. Do your job, Harv. Come on. All right, so anyway, um, Brother I realizes, like, oh, okay, I think Frankenstein might have actually been a little bit above your pay grade and also were attracting attracting some unwanted attention. So we're just going to teleport you out of here. Okay, cool, bye. So he teleports him out of there. He wakes up in the men's room back in Cadmus, and he sees that he teleported out of there with Frankenstein's arm, which sufficiently freaks him out. But Brother Eye's like, eh, don't worry about it. I I did a little bit of snooping on the Shade Networks, and apparently Frankenstein uh, can get multiple arms, so no big deal. Anyway, back to work. And then we cut for one page down to deep beneath Cadmus, where we've already seen this huge lab from issue one. But apparently the people who are working in there of Makari and the Grand Director are working to take down Checkmate and make their own thing. Which I feel like is new, but I genuinely can't remember. But hey, it's a thing. And they're like, oh, uh, Zero Patient is almost ready. And when it is, it will be more than a match for Checkmate, Brother Eye, and the Beast Omac. And when they fall, the Genesis technology will be ours. Anyway, 
if you're actually interested in where this crossover ends up, the next issue of this is going to be Frankenstein number five, so be sure to check out that episode if you weren't for some reason. But yeah, next issue for this one is Kevin Spends a Night at the Zoo, which I, I, I'm so checked out on this book. I cannot express how much. I just don't care about None of this feels like it matters at all because every time he gets into a tiny bit of trouble, he just teleports out, and no movement has been made in any sense of the plot. Brother Eye is still just trying to hack into places. Things are trying to take out Brother Eye, and then nothing ever changes. I'm so bored with this book. Do something, please, for the love of God. Anyway, um... In terms of a standalone issue, I really like Frankenstein, and I feel like Jeff Lemire had some writing credit in terms of the voice of Frankenstein, and I think that's what bumps it up a little bit. So I'm going to give this one a six. I think it's good. I think it's a good but flawed issue, and that the flaw being is that it's part of OMAC instead of part of Frankenstein. But hey, I can only complain for a few more weeks, and then I get to read the stunning conclusion. Stormwatch number five, written by Paul Cornell, art by Miguel Sepulveda. We left off last issue with them um, wrapping up the arc, and then some dude showed up from Stormwatch Shadow Cabinet that looks like a literal walking galaxy and says, All right, Adam, you gotta die. This issue picks up with him killing Adam. He's he's held up to a concrete slab and starts thinking for a minute. He's like, All right, how do I make a death pit? Death pit, death. all right, death pit. He makes a death pit, uh, uses the ship's force fields to keep away the other Stormwatch members from interfering, and then just drops Adam in there and kills him. And everyone's like, did you just, you just kill Adam? And it's like, yeah, yeah, he's he's dead, which means he's part of the Shadow Cabinet now, and he'll be he'll be with us in our realm, which requires you to be dead. And then Marsh Manor steps in and he's like, oh, is he, so he's not actually dead. He's like, no, no, he's really dead. But uh, the only thing he's definitely not is your team leader anymore. So... Let's play who's the new Stormwatch team leader. And he just decides to go through the whole thing. And everyone's just like, all right, I mean, can we have some time to think about it? Because we need to kind of, you know, sort this through and figure out who's going to be who's going to be the person. And he's like, OK, but no, because uh, it's not really a question. So here's what we're going to do. And immediately the engineer steps up and she's like, wait a minute, how do we even know you're from the shadow cabin? He's like, I told you not to ask any more questions and you, you're still doing that. So stop. And he's, he says, all right, so Jenny, you're too young and you're not sure your powers yet. So you're not going to be the leader. Uh, Jack Hawksmore, the God of the cities, you have sex with Wells. I'm not kidding. That's a line. He's like, you're too unpredictable to be lead Stormwatch. Martian Manhunter. You like to pretend that you're the last Martian, but, and Martian Manhunter's like, I did that. I don't want to be it. So shut your mouth. Don't you give away my secrets. And he's like, fair enough. You're not the leader. Engineer. You're too uh, individualistic to lead Stormwatch because honestly, there wasn't even much of a reason for that one. Uh, Harry Tanner, sword guy. You don't have the power because you're just good with swords. And that leads us to Projectionist. That's right. The one that I feel like is the most useless member. You are clearly the leader of Stormwatch. Okay, bye now. So then he just leaves. And he's like, oh, and also where are those new recruits? Uh, find those. And then, you know, he leaves. We cut over to the new recruits, Apollo and Midnighter. They're leaping through Stormwatch HQ just... I don't even do, know what they're doing. They're just running through as fast as they can. And as they're running through, uh, they're trying to find a way to stop the guy, I guess, from doing whatever it is he's doing. And Midnighter's like, oh, if we couldn't teleport out of here because this guy, that guy would have just stopped us anyway. But Apollo eventually stops Midnighter and he's like, look, you haven't given me a reason to work with you rather than work with them. So what's up? And Midnighter's like, look, I worked for the little guy, and my powers always give me a feeling of what could happen next. So I know we're two of a kind. Call me Lucas. And he takes off his mask, shows Apollo's real face. And For those of you who don't know, Midnighter and Apollo are both very, like, gay characters. They are both homosexual. So I feel like this is them, like, saying that out loud now, but they haven't officially said that out loud. But, like, they are. So... 
they when they're saying like, oh, I know we're two of a kind, and he's like, oh, I haven't been hiding it exactly. Maybe they're making that about something else, and I'm just misreading it, but I feel like that's what they're going towards. Anyway, they walk into a room, and they show all the alien threats that Stormwatch has dealt with. And Midnighter manages to figure that out because of its power thing, so he's just showing off for Apollo at this point. And then we cut back into the room with everybody, and Harry goes off to go find Midnight and Apollo as Jack goes and stops, or at least tries to stop the um, dude from leaving for a second. Doesn't work, and he just teleports out. But as soon as he goes, Projectionist is like, all right, look, I don't want to be leader. I literally, I, I don't have a say in that. So hopefully we can just go a little bit without an emergency. And of course, the emergency alarm go- starts going off. Uh, Mid and Apollo think it might be them, but uh, it's a proximity alarm, apparently, which Midnighter finds weird because they're in the middle of hyperspace, so nothing should be able to be here, period. Apollo's like, well, I'll go around and check outside. I've dealt with hyperspace before, and he just flies out the airlock. Meanwhile, Midnighter gets a sense of where he thinks it actually is because it's a diversion. He goes and he finds Harry, who's just pulling out all the data tapes from Stormwatch um, HQ's, like, computers. And he's like, oh, that that thing has taken control of everyone on the deck. I've got to get out of here so I can help save them and blah, blah, blah. And Midnighter's like, okay, that doesn't make any sense. They get into a little bit of a fight, and Midnighter reveals how he's able to use his powers. Just I feel like we haven't gotten a good explanation of Midnighter's powers yet, and this is how they're doing it. But he's his powers are, he can just see things before they happen, but not like in a psychic sense. It's just kind of like a feeling that this is what's going to happen. Um, And he deduces that Harry has some sort of lying power because of it. So anyway, they get into a fight, and basically Harry's just like, look, my leadership is, is what Stormwatch is needing. They rejected my ability to lead them, so I'm going to go defend the Earth by leading them by force if necessary. And Midnighter's like, well, that's not cool. So they get into a fight. And then immediately mid-fight, uh, Projectionist stops and is like, why are we fighting? What's going on? Harry tries to convince her. And it's just like, well, all right, this will work. So he grabs Projectionist, shoots them both into hyperspace via a hyper shoot. Okay. And apparently he left a recorded message for everyone on the ship saying like, hey, by the way, uh, this wasn't personal, but I've had to blow up the ship in order to make sure that uh, the the horn, the alien horn that they found back in issue one could not be blown. So uh, you're all going to die in three, two, one, bye. And then it all blows up. That's where we leave the issue. It's not a complicated issue individually like just taking it on its own i follow exactly what's going on it's just really hard to explain it because it's a lot of changing up of everything going on all at once um but the gist of it is is that midnighter fought harry and harry might have done a heel turn and projectionist is technically the leader now and out of those three things only one of them i think is stupid so yeah, overall, uh, art-wise, I really like this. I, the ending shot of the ship blowing up was just fantastic. I have no problem with that at all. I have kind of have a problem with the fact that I know it's about to be subverted, but I'll let them see how they do it at the very least. So overall, I'm going to give this one a 6. I think it does have its issues. I like the shadow cabinet angle, and if Adam's actually dead, then that's interesting, but I have my suspicions he's not. So... Six up until I feel like there are actual consequences for this issue, which the most I feel is Harry being a heel turn, which honestly I already felt like he was when he absorbed the giant monster a couple issues ago, but hey, whatever. We'll see where it goes. Hawk and Dove, number five, written by Sterling Gates and Rob Liefeld, art by Rob Liefeld and Maret Michaels. We left off last issue with Swan seemingly coming back from the dead and taking Dead Man's prisoner, and Condor breaking out of his cell and getting away, and Dove swearing vengeance for her lover. So this issue picks up with them just having Dead Man in a bottle that's contained with a... I don't know, some sort of gem or something like that. 
Regardless, they use his power in order to open a doorway to the magic world. And Condor's like, all right, so we're going to be using them to find all the other war people. And then uh, soon, once we're inside, nothing's going to stop me. And Swan's like, you mean us, baby. Right? Of course not meaning that. Then we get this whole, like, backstory from Hawk and Dove basically saying exactly their entire history. Hawk had a brother, the original Dove. He died. And at that point, new Dove came in. She never had a choice. They defeated someone named Kestrel, which I guess was another version of Hawk, like Condor is, whatever. And they're chasing after someone so that they can find Boston because Boston is the love of her life. Um, they called up Madame Xanadu, who is part of the magic stuff with Boston Brand, a.k.a. Dead Man, and she advised that in order to find Boston, they had to track down a demon named Gob, who I guess was just running around D.C. Whatever. So uh, they tra track down this demon. They, they get a grip on him. He spits some sort of acid or something at Dove's eyes, but Hawk gets a handle on him, threatens him, doesn't do anything, but then Dove comes up and... Having dealt with the acid, I guess, also threatens Gob. And he's like, okay, now I'm willing to talk. So you'll need to find the entrance to the war realm. And then I guess he tells them where that is. Um, Dove is carrying Hawk back over to where it is. And he's like, all right, put me down. Put me down. We got to talk. So then apparently he wants to talk to her like person to person instead of superhero to superhero. So they change out of their superhero outfits. And... I don't think Rob Liefeld has ever seen how a t-shirt fits on a woman before because it doesn't it doesn't sculpt itself to every curve that well, but regardless, basically it's just a two to three page conversation of, hey, so dead man being around us kind of put us at risk. Are you sure that we should be saving him because he's kind of bad for us, more in particularly you? And Dove is like, I love him. And she kicks stuff while saying this, and nobody seems to bat an eye. And he's like, all right, you're kind of being violent for the Avatar piece. Do you think maybe he's messing with that? And he's like, I love him. So Hawk's not getting anywhere. He's like, all right, fine, whatever. So they go to a place in D.C. where it's a movie theater, and they hop into an elevator, and they immediately start feeling like, whoa, all right, I think we've gone to... The entrance to the war realm, maybe. It's a bit unclear whether or not they made it through the entrance. All I know is that when the door opens up, there is an actual humanoid, four-eyed condor standing there. Just this angry-looking bird man. And he, they just automatically know, like, oh, that's Condor. Because down at his feet are dead men who we can see and Swan, who looks pretty dead. So Hawk comes up, is immediately batted away. And then Dove comes up. And uh, Condor's like... I've seen the war circle, Dove, and you're aren't, you aren't mentioned at all in it. So there, you're something beyond the war circle. You're something greater. I'm going to look forward to absorbing you. And Hawk's like, now I can fight you for whatever reason. So he punches him in the face. And it's great because he's like, ha, that fledgling thinks it can harm me. I have more power. And then Hawk throws a punch and he just goes, that hurt. And then Dove throws a few punches, but Condor managed to get a grip on her. He's, like, dangling her over the city, which for some reason they see as a threat, despite the fact that we've actively, in this issue, seen Dove flying. So I don't I don't know what the problem is of being over the city. But regardless, um, she's trying to, like, goad him into, like, doing something. So he's like, oh, you, you've never tasted my power. You have no idea how powerful I am. I could beat you in an instant. And he's like, Psh, yeah, right. And he slashes her stomach, which then does that same thing that happened uh, two issues ago where this weird glowing light comes out and it just starts shooting holes through Condor. And he's like, oh, no, mercy, please. And she's like, yeah, I'm the avatar of peace, but you have no idea the war, the battle that's been raging inside me. That's why I'm so powerful. Because I'm always angry. More or less, that's what it says. So anyway, Condor like disintegrates and Dead Man and Hawk are like, okay, all right, so that happened. She lands and she's like, Dead Man, I can't see you anymore. Does that mean you're back to normal? And he's like, yeah, babe, totally. But um, 
I am kind of bad news for you, and we shouldn't be seeing each other anymore, so goodbye. And Dove is like, what? But I, I did all this stuff. Oh, that sucks. And Hawk is like, I, I understand why he did it, but I, I understand that that doesn't mean we have to like it. And then the issue just ends. Like, it's not even a big, like, send-off thing. It's a, just a tiny little panel of, like, why? Are we just done with that now? Did that, it, are we just, did, okay, the Condor thing's just done. Like, okay, I guess. <laughs> well, that didn't even feel like a, I mean, I guess they're showing, like, Dove is able to fight her own battles, but was that really the thing that we've been through five issues for? Of just slash her stomach and then you lose? I don't, and I didn't see anything of, like, why he's so powerful. Now, this didn't feel like an ending at all. And I hope it's not, but I feel like it is. And then it all boils down to guy troubles. Like, that's not showing that she's strong and able to take care of herself. No. Bad writers. Ugh. Overall, this is a 3.5. I'm, I'm not a fan. And the art is not great either. The Condor's final form does not look menacing. It's a giant bird man who I don't even get the proper scale of. He just feels like a normal-sized bird man. So, no. 3.5. Let's see what happens next month. Static Shock number five, written and art by Scott McDaniel. We left off last issue with all these now superpowered freaks taken down Static, including another lightning guy named Alkali, and he's dragged down to the bottom of the river by a cement freak and a rubber freak and i call them freaks just because that's literally all they go by so pick up this issue he's being drained to the bottom of the sea and or the river and he's like oh these people are grounded but luckily i can use the metal bands inside the tire one and the steel girders inside or sorry the steel rebar inside the other one to heat them up from the inside using uh faraday's law of magnetic induction so anyway he breaks out and there's one named Wetworks who is just keeping watch and apparently was supposed to call um, Piranha once he saw a body. And so he gives the call and he's like, cool, great. Now tell me, like, we're going to, I'm going to do this the easy way or the hard way. I'm going to take you over to the police. And then we cut back to Piranha who's making the call again. Like he's receiving the call on the other end. He's like, cool. So my guy just saw Static's body. I killed Static. The Slate Gang couldn't give me the security gig. And Slate Gang leader's like, yeah, okay. You guys are like a bunch of freaks who probably didn't make it past the second grade. So you're not going to get that. And someone steps up to the Slate Gang leader and is like, you guys have failed three times to kill Static. He killed Virul and you couldn't figure out a civilian identity. Shut up. And the Slate Gang girl's like, well, he doesn't have a civilian identity. Look here, the DNA of Static and Virgil Hawkins, who's the only person who it could possibly be, don't match. So it's not him. And they're like, all right, cool. But uh, you guys did still fail. So Piranha, you get the security gig. Okay, bye now. Oh, but they need to, sorry, <laughs> this is important. Because in order to truly confirm whether or not Virgil is Static, I guess, they have to kidnap a Sharon, one of his sisters. So it's outside the house. They're all planning to attack. Static is having a nightmare of the night he got his powers. I'm not going to go over it. It's basically he was going to shoot a guy who was bullying him, and then he decided against it, but then he still got stuck in the Big Bang. That's all you really need to know. But he had the same sort of like visual as Sharon's nightmare from earlier in the book, where... He sees his own self crawling out of his own mouth, one of them being static and one of them being Virgil. So it's like a, I don't know, a split identity thing. It's dumb. Anyway, he wakes up. Alkali knocks him out immediately. They go into Sharon's room and pick up Sharon. I'm skipping a page momentarily. Uh, sooner or later, eventually everyone wakes up. And they're like, oh no, Sharon, one of the Sharons has been taken. And there's um, an iPad there that says, did you really think you could escape me? This is only the beginning. So Static is pissed. Virgil's pissed, I should say. And he's like, they took, they messed with my sister again. And it's the same guy who cloned her, which I was unaware of. But I guess, sure, whatever. So 
Virgil makes an excuse to leave as the parents call the police uh, for the kidnapping of their cloned daughter. Uh, going back a page, we go to the East River dock where all the freaks are hanging out at. And Alkali and Guillotine are talking about, like, you're a killer. And the other one's like, no, you're a killer. And apparently that's bad now. And then Piranha starts beating up the Slate gang because he doesn't like them and then all like the freaks show up and also um start beating up on them until one of the slate gang's like hey i'm gonna hold a gun to sharon's head because if you fail to deliver her then you'll be out and so alkali just kills him like chops off his head and levels of kills him and everyone's like Jeez, okay all right well alkali you, you good job i guess and he's upset that he had to kill somebody, but then Guillotina is there trying to like comfort Sharon, and he gives she gives Sharon the whole backstory of like my real name is is Neca Martinez, uh, it's Aztec, and she gives this whole long thing that I could not care less about. But he's like she's like trying to calm down Sharon, I guess. Uh, but then we see there's some SWAT people there who are ready to take the shot on um, the gang whenever. So we cut over to Static. And he breaks into the Slate Gang hideout, and he's just done with their BS. He's, he's just like, where are they? Who took them? He knocks them out um, when they're not giving up any information. He gets the GPS coordinates from their computer and sends it off to hardware. Meanwhile, we see that the police have called out to the gangs below, and it's like, all right, everyone on the ground. Nobody moves, or you're all under arrest. And immediately a fight breaks out. They open fire on everybody down there. Uh, the pale man is there, who, if you remember, is an undercover cop, actually. He gets shot and then overreacts by unloading dual machine guns upon his own fellow police officers. So that Piranha sees that, along with Alkali doing some killing, and he's like, oh, good job, you guys. Keep that up, and you'll go far in my family. Now, come on, we got to deliver this young girl. Uh, then we get the last page of Static basically launching an EMP inside of the Slate Gang thing because all of their stuff revolved around tech, and that should have been the first thing he ever did. But he just trashed all their tech, got on the phone with hardware, and he's like, I'm going to go take care of this guy because he's messed with my family before, and this is too far. And hardware's like, dude, I get it. You're totally right, but just hold on a minute because I'm going to come with the cavalry. So that is what's going on in next issue. Uh, did I did like okay stuff happened I, I get that I'm not saying that the plot did not progress because clearly it did and if anything this is the most the plot has progressed at all throughout this entire series my question being is like why is it everything right now you know like the the issue opened up with him just taking two little low level nobodies to jail and then like, do-do-do, I'll deal with this tomorrow. I have curfew in an hour. And then immediately it's like, all right, now your family's been kidnapped. We've got actual, like, people doing actual killing now. All this crazy stuff. The, the man who has cloned your sister is back in your life. And I'm like, did I miss something? Did I miss the issue where we set up, like, half of this? I still don't understand. If they know for a fact that Virgil is not static by DNA, why are they kidnapping the sister? Also, how does that imply whether or not Static is dead, which they believe he is because of the earlier scene where Piranha got the call? Like, none of this connects, and I'm very confused. Regardless, I'm going to give it a 5 because at least it did something, which I feel like is more than the past four issues combined. So, woo. But it's not enough to save it right now i need them to continue to do well i'm looking forward to the cavalry in the next issue so we'll see how that goes but right now it's sitting at a totally average five animal man number five written by jeff lemire art by travel foreman left off last issue with ellen and cliff being attacked by one of the hunters three and Buddy and Maxine are trying to figure out where they are because they're not at home. Uh, this issue picks up with Ellen straight up firing off a shotgun into one of the Hunters 3, separating off a few limbs. Uh, he, of course, immediately turns, faces her, and tries to come after her. But first we cut to Animal Man, who's flying with Socks and Maxine to 
find the pair of them. And basically, Sox just keeps reiterating, like, look, we should not be going towards the rot in any way. Maxine is the only focus, and we should take her as far away as humanly possible. She is the only thing that matters. If she dies, all of life dies. And Buddy's like, I'm not going to leave behind my wife and kid. And Sox is just like, they don't matter. You don't matter. Maxine is all that matters. So Buddy tells Maxine, hey, if you want to drop Sox, that's fine. I'll understand. So they drop in at Grandma's house because Buddy knew that's where they would meet up if anything were to happen. And Grandma immediately points over, like, Ellen went that way, something's got Cliff. So Buddy gets down on all fours, starts sprinting after. Sox tries to stop him and is like, hey, you shouldn't be going. And he just roars for Sox to back off. Cut back to Ellen. The hunter has got some tentacles all up on her face. And Cliff manages to get a hold of the shotgun and blows the hunter's head off. Doesn't, of course, last very long, but it is enough to get Ellen free. And as the hunter turns towards Cliff, Buddy comes in and delivers just a punch straight down onto its head. Starts trying to beat it up, um, but as it's occupying it, at the very least, uh, Buddy tells Cliff and Ellen just to run, take Maxine, and get as far away as they can. So it's a bit of a wrestling match, but of course the rot wins out over buddy and he's like hey i'm gonna show you what the rot looks like okay that cool here's what we're gonna do so then we cut back to alan and cliff they arrive they get maxine and they're like all right we gotta go we gotta go now and grandma's like what about buddy and mom stutters for a second she's like he'll be fine he's good he has to be so then we see that he's not fine and he's got his tentacles all wrapped up and one of them pierces into his face and it just makes it all disgusting and he's like i'm just going to show you what happens when we get a hold of your little girl and then we get this vision of buddy's head on top of just this pile of organs and a weird spider version of maxine comes up and this is like hello daddy don't be scared this won't hurt a bit and buddy's head is like what 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 won't hurt a bit and she's like this as her mouth gapes open and chews off buddy's face as he's screaming then he wakes up, he's let go, and the hunter's like, won't she be beautiful? And Buddy's like, please, I will do anything, just leave my daughter alone. And he's like, no. And he grabs the detective's body out of the water and just starts beating Buddy with it. And he's not a he's not a slim fella. So then we cut to Maxine, and Maxine feels how her dad's in trouble and how she has to help him. And her mom's just like, no, you are not going anywhere near there. And she's like, well... I don't have to. And she puts her hands on the ground and Sox is like, what are you doing? She's like, I can help from here. Also, as soon as Sox talks, Cliff is like, oh my God, the cat talks. And the grandma's like, that's what you're surprised by? So then we see the hunter back. He's he's done messing around with Buddy and he's like, all right, I'm hungry. Gonna eat you now. And at that, he feels a disconnection with the red. He, He can't use his animal powers right now, but he immediately feels all of life rushing towards them and all of like the woodland critters of owls and foxes and raccoons and bears all come in and start just devouring this hunter and the hunter just starts laughing because he's like what do do you not understand what you've done now the rock can spread through the red we've already won so he's completely devoured and then all of the creatures just pause and then they look over to buddy and they start hissing and roaring and whatever and start chasing him down. Maxine immediately understands what happened, that she was tricked and how the rod is now in the red. But he manages to make his way back over to them. And he's like, all right, everyone in the car. Let's go. We got to go right now. And Ellen's like, well, we're not all going to fit in the car. So Grandma pulls out her RV and she's like, all right, keys are in the ignition. Everyone in. Let's go. So they hop in the RV. They start driving away. Um, everyone's just like, really shaken maxine's upset that she caused this to happen um grandma's upset that they're leaving behind the family dog and socks is like well we can't ever go back and we can't ever stop so and buddy's like i think we can run a few wild animals and he's like you don't understand this is going to be a plague this is going to spread to every creature in the red and nothing can stop it the like no matter where we go they're gonna follow and we see as they're driving down the road spot got infected that was its own little sequence but as they're going down the road with all of these animals in tow um sock says that the only thing that can save them is swamp thing thus officially crossing it over with the swamp thing book 
as I have been mentioning for the past like four weeks now. So, or four months, I should say. So this um, this was great. This was a fantastic issue. I, I It's marked as the final part of the hunt. So I guess this is technically the end of the arc known as the hunt. Uh, there is one more issue in here, but I think it's kind of just filler. I like it. I really like this arc as a whole. I've, I've always been singing the praise of Animal Land. The art is fantastic. The characters very well defined. I, I love the style of it, the substance of it. Everything here is great. I cannot oversing his praises. For this particular one, while it is a major development of the Rot being in the red and now they're on the run instead of playing... Not, they weren't exactly playing offensively, but they were playing... At least, you know, they weren't in, all backed into a corner. Now they're backed into a corner, and it feels very different in the tone of they always have to be looking over their shoulder. So, no, overall, I'm going to give this one a 7.5. I think it's very well done. I just think that it's not big as, like, a conclusion of an arc because this is more of a saga thing going on. This is going to be multiple arcs all linked together. So this feels more like end of act one sort of territory and i like it i really really do so animal man definitely check it out if you haven't uh at least this whole trade i can highly suggest that swamp thing number five written by scott snyder art by yannick paquette we left off last issue with abby and alec making their way uh trying to track down the younger brother of Abby, who I'm blanking on the name of, uh, and not realizing they were heading into the home of the largest meat processing plant after explicitly saying we're avoiding all places where there is death. Uh, this issue picks up in Brazil following a Professor Robert. He's got a guide to lead him through the jungle. And as they reach the protected, recognized territory of the Terena peoples, a native people there, uh, they step out and... Basically, he tries to make conversation. He's like, oh, howdy, good morning, and stuff. And they speak in some sort of native tongue he can't understand. But the guy's like, hey, uh, so the land past this point is sacred to the Terrena people. And you have to, and he interrupts saying, like, yes, I have to prove I'm a reverent man. I'm familiar. Yes, I'll prove that I am reverent. So he starts unbuttoning his shirt, and he pulls it open. And he's like, what do you think? I brought it all the way from America. And it's just this pus and welt filled and it's covered in flies and then the flies all spray out and start doing the head twisting thing that has been going on in Swamp Thing as he then makes his way deeper into the forest past these men. We'll get back to that. So then we cut to uh, 10 miles west of Iberia, Texas. They're robbing a convenience store just picking up some shell calchons and some food for the uh, trip and they're just talking. Most of this issue is just them talking. And Alex says, like, look, I've been feeling the green getting weaker. And Abby's like, I feel the rot getting stronger. And this is this is kind of a thing. As Alec hands, him, hands Abby a can of peaches saying, like, I remember you saying these were your favorite. And Abby's like, oh, I told him. I didn't tell you. And Alec is like, "Hey, this is a this is a place between. There's nothing nothing wrong with that." So they walk out. They're they're happy and they're like, "Ah, I'm, we, what's wrong if you can't enjoy your favorite snack on your way to the Deadlands?" Oh, oh, there's all these all these slaughterhouse creatures here, and your brother up there. Well, oh, looks like we've already lost. So they get into a fight scene. Um, Abby is it's William, by the way, the brother. Abby's fighting up with William, and he's like, "Hey." I'm telling you, you don't want to do this. I, and she's like, oh, you locked me away inside of a hospital, sis. You think I'm going to listen to you? And he's like, I was trying to protect you so you didn't have to deal with the pull of the rot like I have. Like, this is, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help you do that. And he's like, you're, well, too bad. I'm, I'm kind of in it now. Um, Alec, meanwhile, he gets pushed into the convenience store. A couple of wild pigs are keeping him, like, trapped in there. And Alec's like, all right, guess I'm going to have to do this. All right, here we go. And he... He taps into the green. He has like a seed that he pictures growing, and it turns into this giant wild vine that just decapitates the uh, revived pigs, the zombified pigs. And it, he, he just has full control over these plants, and he sends them out, and it just starts impaling and decapitating all of uh, William's deceased creatures, tearing them apart. He gets Abby back on her feet. But as William's running away, he sends a vine out and he's like, all right, time for you to get some fresh air. 
and he picks William up and sticks him up inside a tree. William's, of course, freaking out because he's allergic to chlorophyll. At least that's the belief. And he's like, oh, no, no, I'll die up here. And he's like, you're going to be fine. So they take a second to recover. Abby's like, oh, I just got a little scratch. It's nothing. And Alec offers to bandage her up. She's like, I'm a nurse, too. Like, I don't, you don't have to, don't have to do this. And he's like, oh, I don't mind. And then they just talk some more about Alec's history and how, like, he always knew that the green was there for him. Uh, there was one time when, like, his friends dared him to spray paint something on the edge of this cliff face. But he just grabbed a vine, wrapped it around him, and he knew the vine wasn't going to snap because the green was always there to protect him. And he used to have dreams of the green. And... In the dreams, there was a boy made of leaves and a girl made of bones. And it's like the dreams were screaming at him, Hey, do not go near the girl made of bones. But he doesn't care. So in this moment, they share a kiss. And you see the swamp thing and a skeleton hugging above them in the panel. And in that moment, they messed it all up. Because immediately Swamp Thing, his eyes start looking weird, and uh, William starts laughing, and he's like, "You idiots! You, you've done it! Ha ha ha!" And then we cut back to Brazil, and we see that Professor Roberts and his rot-filled minions have made their way to the Parliament of Trees, aka the source of Swamp Thing, and he's ready to burn it to the ground. He's got fire in hand, and he's like, "Ha ha! The rot has won!" Da da da. So this. In parallel with Animal Man this week, which I am going to start talking about the two as a pair now because they are pretty much entwined. This is like the end of Act 1 for both of them. The rot in both books has won. And this book, I feel like, doesn't quite hit that same level of like, aha, we've, the rot has, is victorious. Because it seems that Alec is only just coming into his power. But I do like how this one handles it because it's something that puts a timer on... Alec. It's not just him always looking over short. This is something that's happening on the other side of the world. He has no control over, but it's something that, like, he's going to have to make a choice regarding his powers right now. So I really like that, and that's probably what we're going to get to next issue, if I'm honest. Um, overall, I, I, I think this arc has been very enjoyable. I'm very much liking, because it's got this strange sort of romance subplot going on, where Despite the fact that things are going so awfully, there's still this, these two people who are inexplicably drawn together. And I really like that in this story. So overall, I'm going to give this one a 7.5. I think it's very well done. Um, the art's done well. The Professor Roberts thing was decently well set up. We knew that Seath or Seth was moving across the world and different people were possessed. So this was this was well set up. Um, I feel like William might have been taken care of a little bit too quickly here, but if that's ever going to be, like, the extent of his power, then I'm okay with that. I'm okay with them just taking this out of the equation right now, and now they have to deal with other stuff. But overall, no, nah, 7.5 is very well done. Check out this and Animal Man if you have not been. Huntress number four, written by Paul Levitz, art by Marcus Toe. We left off last issue with Huntress nearly getting her ass handed to her by one of Moretti's muscle guys, or maybe it was the other chairman guy. I don't know. Regardless, she almost lost, but she swore vengeance and on Moretti. So this issue picks up with her in a speedboat, Mediterranean Sea, and she goes up basically straight up to Moretti's ship, and she's like, hey, a random guy on the edge of the ship, can I come up for a drink? And the guy who's just a henchman is just like, oh, but uh, if you come by the convent tonight, if you, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and get you something there. And she's like, oh, okay, I guess that's fine. Bye. She's like, all right, well, I know we're going to be tonight, so that's cool. She goes back into the Marino Harbor area, and she's talking to her reporter friends who basically are just like, are you, are you sure you want to be doing this? Like... It's a very quiet town, and there are now armed guards everywhere because of Moretti and also, I guess, the chairman coming into town. And Huntress is like, mm, I mean, Pompey, that last issue, not as easy to isolate him. But this time, he's got a false sense of security because of his uh, guards. So 
I'm thinking we're going to be fine. So it cuts to later that night. She basically scales her way up the uh, building. She has one of her reporter friends play distraction by running up to the ambassador being like, oh, did, is there any word on or on the chairman getting asylum here in Italy? And he's like, oh, no comment, blah, blah, blah. And just running distraction. And we see the inside conversation between Moretti and the one brother who came from Kufra. And basically, they just they just actively are like, here's all the reasons that we're horrible scumbags and why we're going to be doing terrible things uh, to everybody, especially the women. And so Huntress is underneath like, all right, well, that sucks. Anyway, she puts a microphone on the edge of the balcony and then starts scaling her way down. But then as she's scaling down, the guards all see her. So they start firing at her. She does some acrobatics, takes out uh, one or two of them, but then just grapples away. She's like, ah, it's a good thing about one of these tightly knit towns. There's always a balcony you can latch onto. So she just flies up and gets away. Um, then we cut to the chairman, who I guess, again, is fleeing his own country looking for asylum. Uh, we see him talking to his son, one of the other brothers. And he's like, all right, well, listen to your brother. When he gets back, uh, I'm going to be in Italy living up the good life. And always remember the, the power of love or something. I don't know. Bye. And so he hops on the ship. Then we cut to Huntress uh, in her civilian gear. She's talking to the reporters. And, like, they know that she's definitely Huntress. But, like, they're still talking like they don't. Like, they're talking like she has secrets. So I don't understand the nature of them helping her. It's later on it gets even more confusing but anyway they're just like all right so what are we going to do now and he's just like i'm just gonna make sure that moretti pays for his crimes and clearly he's not going to be able to fly in um like the chairman isn't going to be able to fly in to italy because of the no-fly zone over kufra but that means he's taking a boat because everything in the series has been on boats so she hops on a boat that Moretti and a bunch of other men are on, and she's like, "All right, I know what I'm doing this time. I'm going to be able to, going to be able to deal with this." So she goes, she sneaks in. The first thing she does is she goes up to the radio signal tower and she puts on a scrambler, so there is no contact. And they are way out at sea, but she's like, "All right, I'm going to wait until I'm sure everyone's asleep." So she takes a little cat nap before uh, sun up, and they just show the panel of her sleeping, and then she just goes, "It's time." So she goes down into the barracks. She drugs two of the muscle so that they can't do anything. She then starts draining the engines of all of its fuel so it can't go anywhere here from the middle of the sea. Uh, an alarm goes off. A couple of men come down in order to see what's going on. They are not the muscle. They're just some guys. And Huntress takes them out pretty easily. So he's like, all right, only two guys left. And then Moretti, so no big deal. She goes back topside and is immediately slashed by a knife. And he's like, oh, okay, I got a little bit, I've got a little bit cocky there. Um, Moretti sees her, and he's like, all right, well, cut off her head, fear to the sharks. And he, she's just like, all right, well, see how that goes. As she beats up the two remaining members of the muscle, immediately Moretti's freaking out. Uh, and there's a bunch of enslaved women there on the boat with him. So Huntress just throws a rope to the enslaved women. And it's just like, I leave him at your mercy. I'm assuming you don't have any left. You do as you want. The police will be here soon. And she hops down off the boat. She lands in the reporter, uh, the reporter's boat. Like, the reporters are there, and they both call her by her name. So, again, I'm not sure the nature of their relationship, but she's like, oh, are you guys, are you okay, Helena? You're bleeding a lot. She's like, ah, it's fine. I'm, I'm glad we got this done. And they're like, well, the, uh, the, they say that Amalfi has been shut down by the army. The chairman arrived there while you were out. So I guess the chairman arrived without problem, but Moretti is officially off the table, and they're just happy to have that done. And that's where it leaves with the police showing up on Moretti's boat. I gotta be honest, I, I've never given too much attention to the reporter subplot because, frankly, it just seemed like a way for them to get information across to the reader up to this point. But now, now that it's up for debate as to whether or not the reporters ever actually knew about her secret identity up to this point, now I'm just confused by the whole thing. Maybe that's on me. Maybe I should have been reading more carefully. It's also a bit difficult when they're using a bunch of terms that apply explicitly to, like, Italian politics that I have no knowledge of whatsoever. But regardless, I was just confused as to that whole thing. It doesn't really impact the story at all. The story so far is Moretti is captured. 
who was the primary draw from issue one. But now we've moved on to this evil chairman guy from the country of Kufra, but whatever. I'm liking this. We've only got two issues left because it is a mini. Um, but it's, I don't know. I'm just, I'm leaving this with a little bit of, it was a good ending fight scene to take down Moretti. It showed her talents and her skills and stuff like that. But I was just kind of like more focused on the fact of the reporters because they kept showing up this issue. And it felt like a big part where they have never felt that way before. Maybe I was just not seeing the forest through the trees. But regardless, that was just my personal feelings on it. I'm going to go ahead and give it a 6.5. It's fine. There's nothing too wrong with it. It's just a bit confusing for me. Maybe I've just should have been reading the rest of the series more closely. I was more focused on the Huntress-specific stuff than the reporter side of things, but maybe that was what I should have been. I don't know. Regardless, 6.5, only two issues. Penguin, Pain and Prejudice, number four, written by Greg Hurwitz, art by Zyman Kudransky. We left off last issue with Penguin ordering a hit on some celebrity couple uh, in order to steal a ring for his new girlfriend. And Batman found some evidence that can link some henchmen to the scene of the crime, so he has a lead. This issue picks up with those same henchmen. They're packing up all their money and getting out of town because they don't want to do another job for Penguin. Uh, they hear some noises outside the window. They go and take a look, and it's Batman. He charges in, immediately starts beating the crap out of them. And he's like, all right, I'm just going to ask you guys a few questions. So Penguin is driving home with his girlfriend, and he's like, she's so happy about the ring. Um, when, as they pull up, they see the three henchmen all dangling from a rope from a street lamp. And there's a bunch of reporters there all recording stuff penguin tries to shoo him away but then a cop comes up and arrests penguin because the three dangling guys identified penguin as the guy who hired them and one of the cops sees the girlfriend's ring and starts trying to take it off her hand without her understanding what was going on uh we cut later inside the police precinct penguins being interrogated and he's just like I'm shocked that that was stolen. I have a legitimate receipt of purchase uh, from a reputable dealer. And he's just like, yeah, yeah, well, sure you do. Look, we know your game, Penguin. And he's just like, you know, you guys are protect all the bullies. You protect the people that, like, look like you and act like you or tough like you. Uh, those Those celebrities, of course, they're all spoiled and rich kids that uh, all just have that special flair to them me how am i any different because i look different that's the only thing because i look like the underbelly you all look like you and i look like me and my lawyer is going to get me out of here in like five minutes so then we cut to the car um he says he wants to stop by his mother's grave before they head back home she he goes in and he talks to his mom for a second of how they're still laughing at him and he sees the mechanical penguin that uh, he left there and he picks it up and takes it back home with him. Uh, we see him taking the helper bot thing that uh, he left for his mom and just start repurposing it, basically. His girlfriend comes down and is just like, Oh, Oswald, I heard you come home. Are you all right? What's these things? And Oswald like has a moment where he's very silent and he has a very sharp knife like right next to her. And he's not answering any of her questions. And then eventually he's like, I'm sorry, I've just had a horrible day. How about you go upstairs and get ready for bed? I'll be up in a minute. She's like, well, what are you going to do in the meantime? He's like, me? Oh, I'm just getting ready. So then we go to an opera scene where Penguin has a balcony and he's allowing his, you know, his girlfriend's there with him. They're enjoying the scene. And then Batman swoops in and literally steals the girlfriend from beside uh Penguin, I don't know why I was blanking on that, without him noticing. And he basically tries to tell her, like, hey, Oswald Cobblepot is not a good man. He is an awful person, and you don't know who you're dealing with. And he, she's basically like, you're the one who just grabbed me without my consent. You just stole me away from my boyfriend. Why should I trust you? He's gentle. He's kind. And she's, he's like, you're blind. And he's like, yeah, and? So... Batman just tries to convince her 
but he brings her back down, sets her back there. And Cassandra basically is like, oh, I'm sorry, I got lost going to the bathroom. She doesn't tell Cobblepot that Batman just tried to convince her of that. Then we cut to GCPD later, and Batman's talking to Gordon because all those issues ago when Gordon tried to convince Batman to get involved in this because of what Penguin did to uh, that one guy, like just ruined his life from the outside in, Batman comes up to him and he's just like, hey, so I looked into your... uh, your, your daughter's friend, when he attempted suicide, he was at that club, the Iceberg Lounge, to sell ecstasy. He's not the good kid that you said he was. And he's like, well, what are you, what are you saying, Batman? And he's like, that line in the sand between us and them, we helped draw it too. So Batman's a little critical of that as well. So then we see... Penguin is enacting a plan. Meanwhile, Cassandra's is there reading a book. And he's launched this penguin-shaped rocket across Gotham. And in its wake is this... It's attracting all the birds, a la, like, Batman Begins with the Bats. This is attracting all the birds. And he fires it towards an elementary school where it just... All the birds go incredibly hostile. They're crashing through windows and attacking children. Um, Batman sees it. He tries to intercept, but basically it just knocks him over down onto the ground. Uh, he tries to like punch its control system to damage it, but it spirals out because Penguin's controlling it. And it, Batman just loves, lands with a thud on the ground as the rocket makes its escape. Or no, sorry, it does crash, but the birds all just fly away because it was the only thing that was controlling it. So Penguin's leaving that place with the bunch of rooms that he goes to. There's a panel with the Joker dressed as a panda entering. Again, I don't know why, but immediately the uh, thugs around Penguin are knocked out. And Penguin just talks to the darkness for a second. He's like, all you have is a flying penguin with no traceable parts or fingerprints. Yeah, it does seem like something I would do. But you have rules being on the side of good, and you need actual proof I did it. So you better get some. And Batman just pops out, and he's like, I will. And then we have a final scene where Penguin, like, turns the corner. He goes into one of the secret rooms, and in there is just this arsenal of at least 200 of those penguin rockets ready to go at any moment. So, yeah, that's where we leave off. Penguin has gone off the deep end here. He is ready to go for blood for after just everybody. I'm loving this. It's it's doing a morality play as well of like is Batman really in the right? Like he just trusted Jim's word of who was good and who was bad, but then when he did his own research, he realized that the dude would probably be someone that Batman would beat up in most circumstances. So I'm, I'm loving this. It's a fantastic story. It looks beautiful. The art is fantastic. Very dark, very moody. I, I cannot overstate how surprised I am by this entire series. The weird, like, rocket penguin thing, it's getting a bit kooky, but it's still staying in a realm of... Okay, there's a guy who dresses at bats. This is okay as well. So overall, I'm going to give this one a 7. I think it's very well done, and I would highly suggest checking it out. So far, so far being, it's got two issues left, and I really hope it sticks to the landing. And that's it. That is all the comics that came out from DC Comics this week, January 4th, 2012. And now we're on to everyone's favorite part of the show, the contractual obligation. So let's take a look at what's coming out next week, January 11th, 2012. There's 16 of them. There are 16 comics. That's just unfair, DC. Why do you do this to me? So those 16 comics are the number five issues of Batman and Robin, Batgirl, Batwoman, Superboy, Green Lantern, Mr. Terrific, Deathstroke, Grifter, Suicide Squad, Legion Lost, Demon Knights, Frankenstein, Agent of Shade, and Resurrection Man. Additionally, we have the number four issues of My Greatest Adventure and The Shade and the number two issue of The Ray. Just 
balance it better over the month, man. Why is there 16 and one? Okay, whatever. Point being. Anyway, if you have any thoughts on the comics I just listed off, the comics I reviewed this week, or anything I'm ever going to talk about ever, feel free to hit me up on Twitter at DC Comics Podcast. That is at DC Comics Podcast. Use the hashtag New52 because it's my New Year's resolution to hear from all three of the people who watch this show. Yes, Mom, that includes you. Additionally, we have a Patreon that you can pay into if you want. I don't put anything up on there, but you can get some pretty cool stuff from other members of the Mild Fuzz Networks at Mild Fuzz TV. The Patreon name is, once again, Mild Fuzz TV. Just $1 a month can put a podcaster through college. We don't really aim for high colleges. So, yeah, that's it. That's all I really needed to uh, get through for the contractual obligations part. I'm, uh, I'm going to start on my 16 comics. I say that, but I'll probably wait until the last minute again because I learn nothing. Because always remember, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs>